Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, I um, uh, am sure that we are in for an illuminating presentation and conversation following that. Uh, let me introduce myself briefly. I'm Al Mully with the Dartmouth Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. Um, my role um, right now is to uh, introduce uh, Carol Folt, the president of uh, Dartmouth College, um, who will introduce the Minister of Health of Rwanda. Um, many of you know uh, Carol. Carol has uh, served as a consummate scholar, scientist, and educator at Dartmouth, um, as well as a leader of all of Dartmouth over the last uh, 30 years, nearly 30 years. Um, as I said, she is uh, currently president, has been um, since July 1st. Um, prior to that, however, she served as provost and dean of art and sciences. Um, she is the Dartmouth professor of biological sciences and um, has done a great deal of nationally recognized, internationally recognized research in metal toxicity and its effects on aqu aquatic life and on human health. Um, she's been recognized both locally and uh, nationally and internationally for her work. Um, she was elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science as a fellow in 2010. And as early as 1990, um, Dartmouth recognized the same qualities um, when she won the Huntington Prize for both her research and her scholarship. Um, Carol? <laughs> Hope I can see you over here. <laughs> Thank you, Al. No, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, before I begin, I also want to express my thanks to Al Mully and the staff uh, of the Dartmouth Center for Healthcare Delivery Science for all the work that they've done to arrange uh, this trip, bringing Dr. Agnes Binaguajo to Dartmouth uh, to visit this week. And I know she's already had many conversations with, with many people in this room. It's my pleasure to introduce you now to Dr. Agnes. I know as she's, her friends and colleagues uh, refer to her that way. And many of you know that she, of course, is the Minister of Health of the Republic of Rwanda. She was trained in Europe, and she worked as a pediatrician in France and Rwanda before accepting an appointment in 2002 as the Executive Secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission. And that is the national body that oversees the planning, the monitoring, and the evaluation of activities to find HIV and AIDS. She left that post in October 2008 to become the permanent secretary to the, minister, to the Ministry of Health and then became the Minister of Health in 2011. While her titles are very impressive, what's even more impressive is the extraordinary the extraordinary impact that her, her work is having on the lives of millions of people. When she chose to return to Rwanda, her native country, in 1996, she was joining in the very serious task of rebuilding a country, a country that had been devastated by genocide. And in the process of being a part of that rebuilding, she helped to create a national health care system that has become, in many ways, a model for all of Africa. What Dr. Agnes and her colleagues have accomplished over the past several years is truly exceptional, and we're going to learn about that today. Since 2005, Rwanda has achieved over 50 percent reduction in both maternal and child mortality, and a 70 percent decline in the incidence of malaria. Rwanda's approach to health care has become a model for other countries with, because it has been built on an extensive network of community health workers. It has a goal for universal access to antiviral therapy for HIV AIDS, and it has very widespread success in, tra in training and treating, training people to treat tuberculosis. It has a very active immunization campaign, and that has achieved, again, another really impressive number, 90 percent coverage of all children, and it's ensured the provision of new vaccines targeting emerging diseases in the population. All of these uh, accomplishments, of course, have been 
bolstered by her tenacious leadership and her ability to unite diverse stakeholder groups around a common and shared vision. We have so much to learn from you when you're here today about learning from your extraordinary experience and how one brings together people to really address these kinds of challenges. So we feel very lucky to have you back on campus. Dr. Anyas first came to Hanover in June 2010, where she received an honorary degree, a Doctor of Sciences degree at commencement. And it was during that trip that I think she met Dr. Mully, and that began this wonderful partnership. They found so many natural synergies between the work that we were doing and the work in Rwanda with its very unique experience in really promoting uh, health as a human right. And Dartmouth, with our strengths in tackling some of these complex problems about quality and access uh, and interdisciplinary rigor and innovation. So these conversations have been wonderful. Over the last year, she and Al worked together uh, to co-chair a Salzburg conference. And I think some of you may have gone to that global seminar. That included 60 faculty, including some of our faculty from Tuck. Uh, from the Geisel School of Medicine, Arts and Sciences at Dartmouth, and also fellows from 27 different countries. Again, reinforcing the real strength of building partnerships and learning from each other. So I really just want to now uh, express again how grateful we are to you uh, for coming here today. I have to tell you, she gave up her holiday to come visit us and spend this week on campus. Luckily, I heard we've, we found a few fun things for her to do, including seeing the play Legally Blonde uh, a couple days ago. So we have, to, we have to do something like that, but we're just so thrilled to have you here. So please, please join me in welcoming her for her address today, Time for a Paradigm Shift in Global Health solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Yes, we, see, we saw together Legally Blonde. <laughs> and uh, one sentence was, is it a point of law? <laughs> and this is a point of science that we are going to talk about today. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you, President Ford and uh, Al Murray, for and all the colleagues uh, for, from the Center for Health Care Delivery Science for have uh, allowed me to be with you today. And uh, it's a true pleasure because, first of all, I start to feel really member of Dasmus family, and it's a good feeling. And also, I like to interact with uh, people very far from my day-to-day -day work. Not so far, in fact, because the most I discuss with Al, the most I can see that we have the same um, objective at different parts of the world. It's about equity, science, participation, and sustainability. And we cannot have equity, true equity, without quality and measurement. What is the purpose to give an equitable bed care? So we need to give equitable quality care. And it's about that that I'm going to exchange with you today. So this is Rwanda, where it is. I'm not going to insist on that, because if you Google, you'll see it. <laughs> but what I want to say, and what is important to, uh, to, to see, is that we have increased the life expectancy from 28 years in 1994 to 55 years today. And this is not a hazard. And for sure, I think that's why we need the participation of academic to measure and to try to give principle, uh, to, to, to put theory be wha behind what we have done. So the life expectancy, you know, um, it's really a summary of everything we have done. And um, I just come back, you know that guy. <laughs> I just come back from the International AIDS Conference um, in Washington, 
And uh, it was a great moment because, you know, the morale of the world was a little bit down after the last board of Global Fund and uh, the last speeches of recession with PEPFAR. And the people across the world, uh, when the world has promised a lot of money for saving mothers and children, they were decreasing the money for people who need it for the day to day survival. And what was good in that conference is that there was a wind of hope for the first time, and also a big recognition of the fact that the problem of global health is a problem of system, and that we need to build system if we want the world to have a better health. And uh, I just put a green tie there because President Kim has bring has brought a north wind of Dartmouth in that conferences. And uh, also he have recognized, he have, uh, as the, the, the president of the World Bank, what gives us hope is that he has recognized that investing in health is investing in development. And that's how, if we want the, the money to work, when we invest in health, it's important to, to invest in quality health. It's not cheaper to do bad care, but the outcomes are totally different. And um, look, this is the map of child mortality in the world. You can see that it's important in Africa. Look at this. This is the map of absolute poverty around the world. Both of them are linked. And that's why investing in health is investing in development. Because child mortality, when the most vulnerable of the population, what are the children under five, are dying at that path, you can be sure that nothing is OK in the country. And um, as I'm a pediatrician, I'm going to give example linked to children. This slide is just to, rem to, to recall the big movement of global solidarity ever that has started in 2002, thanks to some individual like Jim Kim, Paul Farmer, and many others, I, I, I nominate those two because I know them, many others that has been activist to change and to, to, to say that human right is a right of all. People doesn't have to die because they are born in a place and have a chance because they are born in another place. And this is more the money linked to the fight against HIV AIDS but we have seen the same for vaccination and other um, action related to uh, child health. And um, this important increasing in fund was not enough. You know why? Because in many places we forgot the quality. We should have done more with this money. We didn't make the money work, and we didn't buy enough health with the money we have received, for many reasons. This is one of the reasons. Fragmented distribution of the money. Many NGOs. You know, Rwanda is a country that is not bigger than New Hampshire. Same size. But only for HIV, we have more than 2,000 NGOs. Yeah, you can laugh. But coordinate them around one plan. And also make sure that what they deliver is cost effective. Can you imagine the transactional costs people that were in need were losing because there were too many? And also, how to assure that the beneficiaries are the one in need, 
because among them, national or international, there were many opportunistic NGOs that were there because there is money. And uh, so this was my job to coordinate them. And um, we start to reduce them. We ask the people living with HIV AIDS to coordinate at that time, for, that's for HIV, to coordinate themselves by district, to elect who will represent them. Those who win in the district were brought in province. Same, and we had a board nationally, and we just dialogue, uh, had dialogue with the board. We did that with 10 sectors, subsector of the civil society. People living with HIV AIDS, people living with an handicap, the women, the youth, etc. And they help ourselves to coordinate themselves. And they help us to make sure that the money received for them really um, have uh, an impact. And uh, this is an explanation to that. You know, 18 years ago, we were totally destroyed, poor. We are still poor. Uh, there were no, the, do, the number of doctors was really minimum because either they were killed, either they fled out of, of the country because they were afraid to be killed or because they have contributed to the killing. Same for nurses, same for other professionals. And 18 years after, we have a, an economic growth of 8% a year, systematically, the last five years. We have universal coverage for health insurance. We have universal access to vaccination. Uh, we have uh, 450 health facilities uh, distributed um, by sector across the country. And we have based our, our principle of equity, gender equity, geographic equity, age equity, has bear fruit so that the access to care has been now equitably distributed, not because me, I'm coming from Gikongoro, I'm going to build my path where I'm coming from. That was, and it is still the case in many countries. So when we think about care, we think about equitable distribution. This is one piece that expl uh, explain the miracle in the middle. It's equity. The other thing is science-based, meaning we go for evidence. When I want to change a policy, I have to explain only three, que uh, to answer three questions. What are the evidence that show that you need to change? Meaning, what research or, yes, what survey? The second thing is, what change it will bring to the people? And the third, only the third, what are the budget implications? And if it's good, and if we don't have the budget, we say, okay, we put it there, and we go and find the budget together. This is the dialogue we have with the prime minister and the president in cabinet. But also the participation, I cannot bring a policy, the best policy of the world, designed in my office, no way. Design in the ministry, no way. We need to design it with the people that will benefit and with the people that will implement it. It seems that we lose a lot of time, but we don't lose time. Because the day we all agree, it passed through the cabinet. If it's a law, after that, it passed through parliament. Everybody is aware. And everybody implements it like we have it forever. So this, the participatory process is even written in all instructions we, we give. Who contributes and who was consulted? And if somebody is missing or some institution is missing, I'm sent back to do my homework and to bring them on the table. So it's written in the, con the Constitution that we have to go for consensus. And of course, everybody is not happy. I don't pass all the policy as I wanted, but at least what we, pa we pass 
is, is what we have a consensus on. And next time I can continue to fight for my idea. And the, the other thing, sustainability, that's how whatever we do, we need to do it so that we can continue it even if partners are going, if people are changing. And this is also where many of our countries are. I see a couple of African there. Yes. Why our countries are failing, except some of them, we are not going for sustainability. If I'm coming, I'm coming with my ideas. I'm a pediatrician. I'm going to build a pediatric world in all hospitals. I'm not going to build what the people need. I'm going to be driven by myself. And you have the same system here in care delivery. And that's why I say that we have the same problem because those are human problems. When you are not driven by evidence, you are just driven by yourself. And you cannot build sustainability. And now I'm going to show you, and those are slides that uh, have been produced with data coming from WHO, UNICEF, Rwanda reports. And this is the antiretroviral therapy coverage by GDP. You can see that we have reached what we call universal access because it starts at 80%. But we have reached it by very, by, we have invested a lot because for us it's a fortune. But if we compare with some countries that have invested 8,000, uh, uh, the GDP is 8,000 and where they reach, we can say that there is some inefficiency in the system. And we are very proud to have invest among the, the, the it's, it's little what we have invest and it's high what we have as outcome. This is the product of equity and participation and also the sustainability because we have refused to receive the pills. We say we want, before giving, starting and uh, giving the, the IRVs, we say we need to test, meaning we need to build a lab. And the lab we build is re really a blessing for the community because in that lab, we test everything. Uh, after, we need to uh, build an antenatal clinic, improve the delivery system, and then we can go for IVs to give the full package of HIV treatment because the eye of is the, is, the, is the top. But when we do that, we have the participation of all the health sector because with this money, we come and help their work. We have the participation of the entire community because they get a comprehensive care by treating one disease. And that's how we get such a result. This is to show you the vaccination. Our children are vaccinated against 10 vaccines. The six vaccines that are recommended by WHO. Diphtheric, uh, I know them in French, tetanus, coqueluche, you know those things. But also, hemophilus, rotavirus, pneumococcal, hepatitis, and now HPV. And the minimum rate of vaccination for all those, 90%. And this is important to notice because for HPV, in your country, you are only at 26%, something like that. So the question is how we made it. And if we go back, <laughs> it's not a miracle. It's because Starting to the conception of a program, we go for equity, science, participation, and sustainability. This has helped us to build, slowly by slowly, our system to reach this 
minimum. When we decided to go for HPV, big institutions say, no, they are crazy. They are crazy. Impossible. The cold chain, the children, etc. And when we decided to go on a school-based vaccination approach, they decide some among the biggest. I can nominate WHO, I can nominate CDC went to the partners and say, no way. They are going to spoil your name. They are going to spoil your vaccine. And I told them, this is our choice because we know where the children are. And um, with the support of other big partners, people like Nils Dolaire, and people like Paul Farmer, and people like even Jim Kim, where I wrote, in catastrophe over a weekend, now it's time for advocacy. On Monday, CDC was the fun. WHO never denied anything, and we made it. 93% of our girls age 11 are vaccinated school-based and for the second time. And uh, when we started, there are some septics People with skepticism in the world say, how they go for that? It's too, too expensive for them. And we just say, even if we can vaccinate only three, um, uh, one generation, it's good enough. This generation will not have cervical cancer, a killer. And um, I just want to show by this that thanks to people that have conviction that have connections, we have made it. We have proved that you don't need to be rich and have a sophisticated health center, health system, sorry, to make things that everybody believe it's sophisticated. It's just an injection and a transportation of fridge, well organized. The major piece in that is logistics, is not a doctor. And a having a health system based on um, community um, participation, make it happen. During three months, we announced that to the radio and the people are with us the day of vaccination. The local government, central government, the community health workers, the parents are at school. The children are very proud to be vaccinated because we have explained what is cervical cancer even if it was a long explanation, because cancer is not really known. We start to know it now, that we have a longer um, life expectancy. And this true public-private public partnership, with support of the UN, when they had understood, and um, other partners, is the new way to do things when a country is ready. This is to explain what we have done with the money of HIV. The majority was the money of uh, HIV, but we also the money of the vaccine. And um, bringing a lab like that in a remote area is really something that people appreciate and they are there when you need them to participate in a program. So this explains how we integrate. We don't have a vertical program. For HPV vaccine, we receive with USAID a fridge to increase our cold chain, but those fridge serve also for rotavirus, for other things, just for vaccine, but it helps to build a system. And this is the sustainability. Whatever you do, you integrate it. And whatever you do, you make it, you, you buy a type of fridge that your engineer can maintain. It's not all, hmm? etc. So you build and also you do it for the whole health center in the same way, north, south, east, and we insist on that 
probably because of the segregation we faced during years before 1994 up to the genocide of 1994 where, the, according to the president, if he come from the north, he just create the road of the north and develop. We have beautiful hospital in the middle of nowhere. Huh? We use that in Africa, isn't it? Huh? A replication of uh, Rome Cathedral in the middle of the forest, just because they want to be buried in a cemetery that look like Rome etc. So that means when you approach, this is equity and integration in an equitable manner. You, you think also to integrate the programs because if a mother comes, a woman, she's pregnant, she may be HIV positive or not, but it's the same woman that needs good antenatal care, good HIV diagnosis, good treatment if she needs it, Etc. It is the same, same child she'll deliver that will need to fight against malnutrition, that need to be vaccinated, that need to be measured for the growth, etc. So integration is a big principle also. Task shifting is important. You know that we don't have enough doctors. Uh, we even don't have enough nurses, less specialists. So our doctors are doing some specialized care. Nurses are doing care that are um, meant in the some world for doctors. And our community health workers are doing work for nurses. Like our community health workers are injecting for um, starting this year for family planning, long, long, um, long term family planning injection. We just explain to them, if you do that here, you measure, you take the third, and it's OK. They are doing it so perfectly, without any problem. And the advantage for the woman, the women have the service at home. Now they don't have to say, zut, I have missed my appointment. I will go next month. And in between, she's pregnant. So. By using all the capacity we have, we have increased our capacity to give health. And we, are, we just have assured that what the community health workers are doing, they do it after a proper training, and we measure the outcome. That means themselves, they measure the, the side effect, and we go and see, and we monitor. Nurses are monitoring community health workers, doctors are monitoring nurses, specialists are monitoring doctors. So those are, she's a community health worker. You can see she has a phone in her hand. We have 45,000 of them, three per village. We have 15,000 village. Each community health worker has a phone. And with the phone, they send an SMS. It's free. The ministry pay. But they are fantastic. We have, at the moment, somebody in the community discover an outbreak, we are informed by SMS. When a woman needs an ambulance to go to the hospital, SMS. When we want to send a message to all, like now there is an outbreak of Ebola in Uganda, we SMS all of them. Be careful. These are the signs. If you see something, alert us. Same when we had uh, an outbreak of cholera in the border of Congo. And we had imported case because we have our friend, brothers and sisters from Congo who prefer our health system when they are really sick. They died, thousands have, di uh, have died in Congo. In Rwanda, we had few imported cases, no death. Why? Because of those fantastic people that have went to no high school no university, but they manage almost 80% of the disease at community level. We have trained them to, to diagnose and to treat malaria. We have trained them to, to diagnose cough without any other sign and give ampicillin. And um, also, they do a report every month. But 
If the person they treat doesn't improve within 24 hours, they transfer the person to the hospital. And in any case, most of the people, you know when you are sick, hmm? either you go to the doctor immediately, either you never go. Huh? There are many people here, I'm sure, they say, I'll go, I'll see tomorrow. I'll see tomorrow. And unfortunately, in a country where the roads are not good, tomorrow is most of the case too late. But now that it's your neighbor, you just go there, you got the test, you got the painkiller, the fev fever killer, you got the antibiotic if needed, you, got, you, you get the anti-malaria if needed, and either you recover, either the person visits you twice a day, and at the end of the day, she says, now it's time to go to the hospital. And this community peer pressure push you to the hospital, even if you didn't mean to go before. And with that, the, the, the rate of death have decreased dramatically. Of course, we learn the system as we do it. In the beginning, we give them anti-malaria only, not the rapid test. And we panicked because our rate of malaria um, reported jump like that. So it became a national issue. And it's because they were giving the anti-malaria for any fever. So we provide them with the rapid test. And now we have evidence of what we are doing. So another reason to show you that evidence are absolutely needed when we build a system. This is the Butaro Hospital, five-star hospital, in the middle of nowhere. In that district, there were no host district hospital. And with the global solidarity, we built it with the uh, the support of President Clinton, uh, some people from Boston, Patnain Health, and the government of Rwanda, we have this beautiful hospital in that uh, in Butaro. And ten days ago, President Clinton has inaugurated because in that hospital we have our first center for uh, uh, for cancer treatment in a rural setting. And it works. We have, uh, an, we don't have an oncologist, a national one. We have borrowed one from uh, uh, Birgam Hospital, a lady who accepted to come and work with us during two years. And by opening the words, I have here that uh, uh, end of last week, the word was full. It's not that the need was not there, it's that the capacity was not there. And um, you can see that um, we can give also, it's not because the poverty is not a fatality, that's what I want to tell you. And when we have a global connection and global solidarity, we can reach beautiful, useful, um, services and infrastructure like that. And it was so good that when President Clinton visited, he said this is a good place um, to be sick. Because you know why? No, 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 no. The setting is beautiful. The, the beds are like this, you know, head to head. Everyone see, this one see in a place, but the other one see the, the, the eels, it's beautiful. If you have a chance, just come and visit. But not only that, so we say, so we, say we can preserve a word for you if you want, because uh, it helps us to build it. But it's not only that, it's that uh, with uh, the support of mass, I don't know, I, I guess mass is known, um, we have apply scientific uh, principle for fighting against infections. You know, I don't, I, I, it's, it's engineering. Huh? And at lower cost, we have a solid, beautiful infrastructure that serve a population and have teach us how to do uh, infrastructure that help us to provide the best care. 
using infrastructure as well for fighting uh, infection. And uh, why I like this is because now when we build a hospital, we tell everybody, go and see there, try to learn a bit, and come and propose us something. They also, they are going to create in Rwanda, before we didn't have a school of architecture, they have helped to create it, and now we are going to have a master in health infrastructure. You see, from nothing, we are going to be among the best, just by global solidarity. This is to show you um, the outcome, uh, as I told you, the uptake of family planning, that um, the uptake of service, uh, the delivery in health uh, assisted um, deliveries, uh, the uptake of uh, bed nets use, and the last one is um, the vaccination. Hmm? And um, so, I don't have to tell you that I'm proud to work in Rwanda, but when you saw um, children, uh, di these are the different DHS, the, the Demographic and Health Survey. Hmm? So population-based and international done. Uh, and um, this is the decline of uh, mortality. You can see that for HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, more than 70% decline between ten, the last 10 years. For pneumonia, more than 60%. And it's going to be more because we have introduced pneumococcal. For diarrhea, almost 50% decline. And it's going to be more because we have introduced rotavirus. 50% of our severe diarrhea that need hospitalization and kill babies, rotavirus. This is the result for child mortality. It took us up to 2005 to reach, to catch up with the damage of the, de the genocide. And people believe that after that, we have to continue like the green line. Uh -uh. We continue the high speed of the yellow line. And I'm very proud to say that according WHO, because we fight a lot on data, they have recognized that we have reached the MDGs and 2011 for child mortality. So it's just by using those principles, equity, science, participation, and sustainability. This is um, also uh, the rapidity of decline of child mortality by investment per capita. You can see that Rwanda is the miracle. Hmm? It's not the miracle. And the important thing is we need to prove that it's not a miracle. It's not because we got a visit of a high spirit somewhere and no, it's the result of hard work of community health workers, nurses, doctors, but also good plan, monitoring and evaluation, and evidence-based uh, program. But whatever, um, you can see that we still have a long way to go. A long way to go in um, in uh, Rwanda and a long way to go in the continent. Because um, we will not be good if we are alone in the region. Remember where we are, in the heart of Africa. I have a friend who used to say, when Rwanda is bad, the world is suffering, Africa is suffering because it's the place of the heart. Hmm? We need to, our, fellow brothers and sisters around to reach the same level. And to apply the same principle so that we are not a hub of something in the middle of nowhere. 
It's never good to be in the middle of nowhere. We need to, this is also global health. Global health for you starts in Dartmouth, the way you deliver health, the principle behind your clinical services. For us, it starts also in Rwanda. The next step is in Burundi, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Africa, but also in partnership with all of you. Because we need Africa. If we have proof that we can do it, coming from scratch, that means it's something we can do. And when we know that we can do, not doing it is quite criminal. So we have to do it. We have a moral obligation to do it. But also an economic obligation, a scientific obligation that is nothing that can allow us to run out of this responsibility. And you can see that there are too many children. In Rwanda, we have universal access to IOVs. In Africa, we have 50% of children that die before the age of two, when they are HIV positive. We have 23% 20, of uh, the children worldwide that doesn't access, uh, that uh, have access, meaning uh, 77 that doesn't have. When IOVs, we can have the treatment now for $200 a year. So that means those children, even adults, are dying for $200 a year. The cost of a good restaurant somewhere. Hmm? And 90% of children with uh, some cancer are dying, still in Rwanda. We are just starting to tackle cancer. Because as we have stabilized infectious disease, we can now use the system of health we have created to go for the next step, that is cancer. But I told you, we don't have an oncologist. We just sent a couple for study. But we are going to do that. And Africa is really the place of the world where the maximum of disease occur. 90% of children uh, with the disease in Africa die when they don't die when they are born elsewhere. So one of the principles also, the challenge, is to link an equity plan to a delivery system. No one will do that without the four principles. We need sustainability, but against science equity. And behind that, of course, quality. So when we set our target, we need to set the target with the people that will benefit, and also the people that support you. And we need the strategic planning, but essentially, we need to monitor and to evaluate. An example, more than 75% of drop in mortality for malaria. And we didn't know if it was because of mosquito nets, because of spray, because of la la less of the lack, um, the dust have decreased in the country because we have declared the war to dust. And we had that result and country asked us, what is the best to do? And we don't know what to answer because we were doing everything. In the urgence of delivery services, we don't measure the part on the impact of each. After that, we understood where it came from mosquito nets. And you know why? Because for a um, global fight, we were not able to procure mosquito nets during one year. We can count it 600 deaths because we were denied the right to procure mosquito nets one year. So we know the impact, but on the back of 600 deaths. So. I hope that uh, with the new program, Human Resources for Health, and I want, I'm pleased to tell you that the first faculty from the US has arrived in Rwanda and they are from Dasmus, Professor Lisa, with the daughter and the family. 
they, are, they have arrived. And because the next sust sustainability part for us is to have enough doctors and nurses to, to, to give the next care we want to give, that is specialized care. Our population live more than 50 years, 55 years. We start to see some di chronic disease, some cancer that we don't know how to treat, that we didn't teach our students. So it is always the issue of chicken and eggs. We don't have teachers. We cannot recruit students. And we have no students, so we don't have future teachers. teachers. So we have, uh, I love to say that we have borrowed the chicken, academic chicken of uh, the US to help us to produce the eggs that will produce the Rwandan chicken within seven years. But um, it's also good to tell you that I have, uh, I have learned your study, your, your story, sorry, when uh, I was, uh, had the privilege to receive an honorary degree. And I can see that Darthmus and Rwanda have achieved a lot. But if we give a hand, we can together achieve more for many reasons. And um, I want again to thank you, President Fold. Thank you, Al. Thank you, all of you that have made my stay a five-star stay. <laughs> really appreciated, and it was a pleasure to exchange with you. Thank you. No, my mother will uh, disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, I'd just like to ask you, uh, in, out of respect for everything you've done, and I, in terms of recent criticisms from the West and your president, I'd like to just know uh, your opinion in, uh, in terms of the genocide. Was there a, uh, amazing effort on the part of the president, yourself, and uh, a reaction from outside funders to go in and do the best they could for Rwanda. When, sir? Hmm? During the genocide? After the genocide. During the genocide? No, after the genocide. After the genocide. Was there a really massive uh, effort from the outside of your country in terms of funding and human capital, and also from the leadership of people like yourself and your president, president to t really elevate Rwanda's health care uh, to such a high level. Of course, there was. <laughs> but um, just after the genocide, uh, I, I can take zero credit. I came back in 1996. And uh, I start uh, working nationally in, 90, in 2001. Hmm? Uh, but you know, what was the President uh, Clinton says? This <laughs> gentleman was there. What did he say with the total? Uh, President Clinton looked at some of those graphs and uh, talked to the minister. He's been following Rwanda's progress for a long time. And he said, uh, back where I come from in Arkansas, uh, we have a saying that if you walk down the street and you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know it didn't get there by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Hard work and good politics. And, and let me tell you also, if you don't have politics that is human rights oriented, you never get that. So all this, because my mother will never watch the film, 
I can tell you it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> the current criticism, bullshit. I just want to say one, last, one counter thing to the president puts. Yeah. In my opinion, and you can re, uh, reply to this, President Clinton reacted after the fact. I agree. And his administration for quite a while refused to I re agree. use the word genocide. I agree, but you have self, uh, you have pay back to the world after. Okay. You understand? Yes. Eight million people on Ayurveda. The contribution of President Clinton is high. So what he dedicated to the, the, his legacy to the humanity will be great anyway. But that's true that it let us down during the genocide, and he has apologized. Let me, um, let me just uh, close by uh, thanking uh, Dr. Agnes again and to, um, to um, e express a hope that you all recognize um, how much we have to learn from a system built on equity, uh, science, participation, and sustainability. Um, we have a great deal to learn from what can be done in Rwanda. We have a great deal to learn from what can be done in other contexts where resources aren't as available as they are here in this country. Um, and um, I think all of my colleagues who spent time with the minister over the last several days have recognized that. For those of you who are Dartmouth College employees, let me just give you one example. Dartmouth Health Connect. Dartmouth Health Connect is a new way of thinking about primary care at the front end of, of uh, um, participation with individuals who live with the consequences of the care that will be delivered. And it comes from exactly this model of a companiator, a promotore, of people who um, have uh, not the level of training that we are used to when we seek health care, um, but who can per connect and create a level of participation um, with individuals who receive the care or do not receive the care, live with the consequences as a result and achieve outstanding results here in this country as well as around the world. It's just one of many examples of what we have to learn uh, from what um, Dr. Añez and her colleagues are doing yeah. in Rwanda. They create what we call social capital. You know, there was a great anthropologic study done by somebody in Harvard that say why in Africa people on IOVs are more compliant than in the North? And the answer was social capital. That means they, they feel collect, connected. And those accompaniators, those community health workers are creating that glue that pull you in, uh, in, uh, in uh, adherence to your treatment. Our adherence and our rate of survival is better than in New York. Mm -hmm. Hmm? And so it's denying those people the massive movement that was against Africa to read, to get access to IVs. They say they will never manage. They don't have a watch. They don't know what time is. They will forget. They don't know how to count. They are illiterated. And we have better now adherence and survival than in developed country because of social capital. Well, again, thank you very much.